there, so I'm going to require your listening, your participation in, in speaking, because I th there's no script here, so this is going to be being pulled out of thin air. Um, first, uh, as I said, I, I've been working with the apprentice of the Carlos Castaneda for quite some time. And since death is in the air, since Chico's passing, death is in the air. The seers of ancient Mexico used to think of death that they called death the definitive journey. El, el viaje de, definitivo, the definitive journey. And Chico's are on his definitive journey. And we will follow him. We have no choice. And it's what's at stake here, how we can use, how we can benefit from that is how present we are to our own mortality, how present are we to our own death. As again, the seers of ancient Mexico used to think of death used to sit on your left hand shoulder and it would never lie to you. You could ask it anything, it would never ever lie to you. So, so it's the invitation here, and since death is in the air, is to have death more present in our, in our own being. Because as soon as we're born, the moment we're born, we have death as a partner. The moment we're born, we have death as a partner. And we're all, always on our way. So one day we'll have that, all of us, nobody's escaped it quite as far as we know. Well, there's a couple of sorcerers apparently that have escaped it. But other than them, most of us are, are heading into the great unknown. So uh, I was in Japan recently on a second, uh, Mutsuko and I went on a pilgrimage in Japan. We were retracing some of the trails of the, of the Yamabushi, the mountain ascetics. We did about 70 kilometers about three years ago, climbing some of the mountains that they train on. Um, and then we went up north, this time we went up north to the Dewa Sons on three sacred mountains that each mountain replicates a certain stage of one's existence. The first mountain, Mount Haguro, represents death. It's, you climb 2,500 steps up into the mountain by stone steps that were built 1,400 years ago. 1,400 years ago. And you climb these steps. And then you get to this massive temple shrine at the top. And, there's a, and in this shrine represents these three sacred mountains, the Dewa Sanzan. Sanzan means three mountains. Um, and then you go on to the, the second mountain. So the first mountain is birth, represents birth. Gasan, the second mountain that we climbed, it represents death, since we just mentioned death. And we came down the other side, let's go nine. It was really harrowing. It was really, people have died on. It was really steep. There were even ladders going down. But we made it to the bottom. We got to the third shrine, you don't know, which represents rebirth. So we went to these three shrines, went birth, death, rebirth. So, um, and then we continued our journey down to Kyoto, and then we did the southern Sanzan, the Kumano Sanzan. The, these are pilgrimages to the Kumano shrines in, in Wakayama Prefecture, not far from where Micho was born. In fact, one of the pilgrimages we started was about five kilometers from where Micho was born, Kok Kokawa in Wakayama Prefecture. So we, we climbed uh, up this ancient trail to Koyasan, where Buddhism was set up in Japan. Very steep, tough climb. And uh, while we were in Kyoto, we came across a calligrapher. And uh, she, she, she will do any kind of writing that you want. So we went in and we met her. She was a sensei teacher, a calligraphy teacher. Shodo is the Japanese name for calligraphy. So she was a Shodo sensei. And she said, would you like something to be written? And I was thinking, thinking. And what is the, what is the four syllable Japanese phrase we use to capture the essence of macrobiotics? Do any of you remember from your study of Michio? What are the four Japanese syllables? Shizu and Shoku? No. Any of you recognize this? Let's see, let's see. Shindo Fuji. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Shin, body. Do, earth. Fu, not. Two. Body and earth, not two. That's why I asked her if she would do that for us. So she took, she took this, she, took this I, she said, what colors would you like? And they had some examples of I said, I'll, I'll go with the red and the gold. So she took some gold ink out and she did this. She, 
And she did two of these. So I have one hanging in the center comb board. So in, in honor of uh, Chico, I want to pass this on to the Lisbon Center. By the way, we, we, have it, there's a, we have it on a scroll, Jimmy, we have it on a scroll, and we put it in the middle of the scroll. So if you can find a scroll that'll, that'll fit in, that's the best way to display it. I'll send you a photo image of that. Okay, so my talk. So, <laughs> yeah. Big picture of microbiomes, yeah. So I came in like some, like some other colleagues in the room, friends, associates. I came in on a, a particular wave of microbiome. I came in on an early wave. I was coming out of the 60s and experimenting with a lot of psychoactive chemicals, let's say, <laughs> which kind of opened up my consciousness, temporarily anyway, big mind-blowing experiences. And I realized there was more to reality and there was more going on than what appeared to be going on. And, uh, but I, I noticed after each experience you'd have to come back to reality and you were no better off for that. So you had to come down eventually. <laughs> so the whole point was to look for a discipline or a path in which you could work your way, earn your way to these higher states of consciousness. So that was the intent, that was the thrust of how I entered macrobiotics. <clears throat> I wasn't particularly, I'm sure there was some health issues, but I wasn't, there was nothing really wrong with me. I was young and vital. I just did hard, worked hard. Uh, but that was the, that was the wave of, of, of uh, people who came into macrobiotics at that particular time. The healing element was more secondary. My first consultation with Micho was, do it was just a, he had a little hat with book you could donate. I donated a dollar and I got a consultation. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. And you know, since Micho, he, he, he raised his prices a little bit over the coming years. <laughs> and I was just so, looking at him, I was just so mesmerized by this Japanese guy looking at me. I didn't even hear what he was saying. Um, so anyway, I became, this is 19, the early 70s, so I became a student there, started going to the classes on, on, on uh, Arlington Street, um, and uh, they eventually became the manager of Air One Newberry, built another store for them. So I got in on the food side. And, but I was so inspired with Micho, and there's several people coming back from Japan, Evan Root, and some other folks are coming back from Japan. And uh, I decided I'm gonna go there. So in 1974, I went to Japan, pretty much stayed there through the mid 80s, came back, and, uh, but my interest has always been on evolving states of consciousness. And, and, macro, and I wanted, my, my, my inquiry, my question was, what role does macrobiotics play in expanding states of consciousness or evolving awareness? And, uh, and I realized over a period of time that we weren't really equipped. We didn't really have all the tools in the toolbox to do that. So I started investigating other, other modalities and uh, started to integrate those into what, into what I'm doing. So what I discovered along the way, which I think may be of, of value to us here, is there's something, there's something that's been, something happening to human being in this particular era, going back into the 60s and 70s, there's, there's something happening to human being um, that has to do with the unfolding of our own possibilities. And that's what I want to really, I want to talk about. But there's something so fundamental and so foundational that we have yet to distinguish about consciousness that we've yet to question um, that's a, that for me is a missing here. Let me, let me say what I, let me give you an example here. Um, normally, when we're perceiving the world or perceiving people in our lives, we tend to, without even thinking, th believe that we're perceiving things as they, as they are. 
when in fact our perception may be have certain bi inherent biases in it that we don't recognize in our own perception. <clears throat> that is, consciousness itself may be a kind of lens through which we perceive. And that lens may be skewed or have certain biases or certain moods or colorings given by our particular history, not just our personal history, but our cultural history as well. We're, we're in a particular kind of time right now where we have a strong personal identity. Yes? We have a strong personal identity. There's a, there's a, we all share a sense that there's a, there's a me in here. Common intuition, common experience tells us there's a me housed in, in resident in here somewhere. Yes, that's the common experience we have. Likewise, there's a, we share a common experience of a, of a world out there. So there's an in here, subjective self, and there's an out there, an objective world. And it all appears to be occurring in a linear stream of time. These are, the fun, these are the fundamental pillars of modern reality that we don't normally question. Well, starting in the 60s and 70s, people began to inquire about the validity of those three assumptions. The first assumption that there's a me in here. The second assumption that there's an independent world happening out there rather randomly happening out there until we kind of impose a, a, a macrobiotic in yang spiral seeing on it. There's just a world happening out there and it seems to be happening in time. Now that's the basis of modern Cartesian Newtonian reality that we've inherited, we've inherited by virtue of being born at this particular time. And we've yet to question or inquire into the fundamental basis and validity of those three assumptions. So we work, we, we perceive through the lens where that has not, those three assumptions have not been accounted for, whether they're in fact hold up. Now there were early states of consciousness and reality. If you go back far enough, there was a flat earth at one time. There was an agreement, there was a cultural agreement that the world was flat. And if you looked out the window, common experience told you that the world was, was flat. But then, and if the world was, was, was flat, was a, a, appeared to be flat, then that had an effect on how you dealt with the world. If you were a sailor, for example, and you, in your reality the world was flat, that would have an effect on, what's that, Anna? Five minutes. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> So anyway, after a while, it got, the flat earth model got exposed because people didn't fall off the edge of the earth when, when they went far enough out to sea. So how am I going to do this in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, then later, there was a more advanced model of reality in which the earth was the center of the universe and the stars, the moon, and the sun rotated around the earth. The earth was at the center of God's love and creation. It was a geocentric model of the Earth. And then a guy named Galileo was looking through some telescopes and looking at the moons of Jupiter and the rotation of Venus and the, the revolution of Venus, and he realized he had an aha moment. And in that aha moment, he says, it moves. Do you know what the it was? Yeah. The Earth. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the center of the universe. So suddenly the Earth was decentered. So, and then we arrive at our time, right? You know, in our our, our particular reality right now. Um, where we have an inner subjective self, an outer external world, and we have the notion of time. And we all share the experience that we're sharing time, is that right? We, we all share time. We have to, we're organizing this event according to time and schedule. But in fact, Einstein's theory of relativity, which has been proven over and over again, proves that time, there's no absolute time. 
Time is relative to each per the movement of each person. And if, for example, if you've been on a, on a spaceship and were able to travel at the speed of light for six months out and come back to Earth one year, your clock would say one year, six months out, six months back, the people on Earth would be 7,000 years older. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it, it's just time. It's just time. <laughs> <laughs> it's relative. It's relative. There is no time. There is no time. Exactly. So. <laughs> okay, we're going to end it right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.